No, it's working. Yes. Thank you. I have nothing to disclose. In 2016, individuals between the ages of 13 and 24 accounted for approximately 21% of the new HIV infections in the U.S. And for Baltimore City, um, specifically, 58% of the, all the new HIV cases were among gay, bisexual, and same-gender-loving men. And in this presentation, we used the um, men have sex with men, or MSF, for this presentation. And 78% of all the new HIV cases identified as non-Hispanic black. And the large proportions of um, HIV-infected individuals were between the ages of 13 to 24 and 25 to 34. So this is important when thinking about the key populations regarding HIV prevention efforts. Pre-exposure prophylaxis is a medication used to prevent HIV acquisition, and when taken every day, um, individuals' risk can be, for HIV infection can be reduced by about 92%. And in 2012, the FDA approved PrEP to be distributed to individuals 18 years or older, and in 2018, PrEP was approved for adolescents. Um, but despite the new access to this resource, um, various bar barriers such as parental consent, cost, and stigma have presented a challenge, particularly for youth populations. So, so for, this for this project, we use information from Project IMPACT, which is a national CDC-funded initiative that strives to increase PrEP delivery and uptake among priority populations, and it also tends to reduce health, um, HIV-related health disparities. And below are the partner sites, and the data was evaluated by the Johns Hopkins Center for Child and Community Health Research. So the um, purpose of this project was to describe the overall PrEP cascade among young MSM impact clients and to compare the PrEP cascades by age and by race and ethnicity. So here's a graphic of the PrEP cascade that we'll see throughout this presentation. And um, just to go through it a little bit, to start, we um, wanted to know who was eligible based on risk. And for this project, we focused on just MSM individuals. And of those who were um, eligible for Project Impact, who were referred for PrEP, meaning who received additional information about PrEP. And of those who were referred, who accepted and was linked to a medical provider to learn more about PrEP and how to get formally connected to PrEP. And from there, um, we want to see of those who were linked to a medical provider, who, were, who was formally assessed for PrEP to make sure they weren't taking PrEP already, and again, that they were um, ready to um, start this medication. And again, of those who were assessed by a medical provider, who was deemed clinically eligible, meaning that they haven't um, um, since their first initial process become HIV positive and who wouldn't have an adverse reaction or who could be potentially committed to taking this medication and being adherent to it. And of those who are clinically eligible, who would be, um, who were prescribed to the medication and of those who received a formal prescription from a medical provider who was currently on PrEP and for this project, um, currently on PrEP was defined as individuals who were um, noted to be still on, still taking PrEP between January and March 2018. So we'll see this cascade throughout the presentation. Again, for the participants, we use clients from Project Impact in Baltimore specific, specific, specifically. <laughs> and then um, we excluded the, we restricted the data to um, men who have sex with men or MSM. And again, for this project, youth were defined as individu individuals between the ages of 13 to 24. And the data was collected from various sources um, from the impact clients between September 2015 to March 2018 in Baltimore. And we collected information regarding the demographic information and information pertaining to the PrEP cascade categories as, as described earlier. And later, we um, calculated the proportions of individuals with, within each demographic characteristic and for the cate cascade categories. And then we conducted chi-square tests to determine um, any type of statistical significance when comparing the proportions. So here is a, a table of the demographic information. And of the um, MSM individuals who were eligible for PrEP, about 28% would have were categorized as youth between ages of 13 to 24. And the mean age of the overall group was about 31 years of age. And for youth, the youth group is about 21 years of age. And in general, for both the overall group and for the youth group, the majority of the individuals identified as non-Hispanic black. So here is a, um, our first cascade for the entire youth MSM group. 
So we have a total um, of 399 individuals here. And again, just to go over um, in a little bit more detail, of those who are eligible, 45% were referred to PrEP, meaning they received information, more information about PrEP. 49% um, of those individuals um, accepted PrEP, meaning they wanted to connect to a medical provider. 100% of those individuals were connected to a medical provider. And then 99% of those individuals were assessed for PrEP. And then 98% of those individuals were deemed clinically eligible for PrEP. And 88% of those who are clinically eligible received a, a form of prescription for PrEP. And 28% of people who received a prescription were determined to be currently on PrEP between January and March 2018. And so one of the, one of the first takeaways from this cascade is the major drop between those who are eligible for PrEP based upon their risk and those who receive additional information. And we, this, is a, this is a major area of opportunity here because we want people who could benefit from PrEP to receive more information about the medication and how to get connected to so some, some place to focus on in the future. And then secondly, um, we see here that 28% of people who were prescribed PrEP were currently on PrEP. And this is definitely a major area, area of opportunity here because, again, PrEP is... Um, most effective when taken every day. So we want people who receive the medication to be adhering to it as much as possible. So those, that's another, another uh, main takeaway here. But in general, adherence issues have been a, a noted um, challenge in the literature for youth populations. So ne next we want to compare the youth group to adult MSM. And um, again, the the, the bar represents the number of people per category, but the most important aspect is to look at the percentages here. And so we see that they both follow a general downward cascade pattern here. And then again, you see the major drop between those who are eligible to those who refer for PrEP for both groups. So this, is, um, this indicates that um, receiving materials and not receiving additional PrEP materials is not simply a youth issue, but an issue overall to address in the future. And then later down the um, cascade, you see for accepted link all the way to prescribed, the numbers of the percentage is about the same. But when you go to prescribed, the differences are about um, 7%. And for who is currently on PrEP, the difference is about 9%. So these differences aren't statistically significant, but it does show that perhaps youth could benefit from additional efforts to help increase the, um, the proportion of prescription for people who want to be prescribed to PrEP and to, again, um, increase the number, the proportion of people who are currently on PrEP as well. And then later, we wanted to uh, stratify the youth MSM group by race. So here we're comparing um, individuals who are non-Hispanic black to those who identify as non-Hispanic white. And again, you see the um, standard dr major drop between those who are eligible and those who refer to PrEP. But if you look even closer, you see, um, again, look at the percentages um, in particular, there's about a 14% difference in who's actually receiving more information about PrEP, where you see that those who identify as not Hispanic or black, 41% or, um, of those individuals received more information about PrEP compared to 55% of those who identify as not Hispanic white. And this is a major problem or area opportunity because we want to make sure that, again, whoever is eligible for PrEP and can benefit from PrEP regardless of their race can have access to more information um, so they can choose to um, be prescribed and linked to PrEP if they want to. And later down the cascade, you see about a 20% difference for those who are prescribed for PrEP. And you see an even greater um, difference, about 32%, for those who are currently on PrEP, where you have 18% for those who are non Hispanic black and 50% who are non Hispanic white. And again, you, we definitely want to focus on this area in the future to close this gap between the two um, demographic groups at this time. And lastly, we wanted to look at um, compare cascades for those who identify as Hispanic to those who did not identify as Hispanic here. And again, um, the, the similar cascade occur, cascade pattern occurs here, but what's interesting is that for the, we only had about 34 people who identify as Hispanic from our group. And so we, we're unclear at this time whether this is representative of the racial demographics in the city, or is this is a population that we need to put more effort into um, reaching if there's more people who could benefit from PrEP. 
So in general, PrEP cascades do not significantly d differ by adult and um, between adult MSM and young MSM, but additional efforts are definitely needed to increase PrEP referrals and adherence among young MSM, particularly among black young MSM. So in the future directions, I would like to assess the potential key barriers and facilitators for PrEP referrals and current PrEP use. We would like to uh, later analyze PrEP cascades for other priority populations in Baltimore, such as transgender individuals. And we'd like to compare findings from the partner sites to see which sites have um, reached certain communities better than others and how can we improve on that front. And later, we'd like to compare our findings with other impact US cities, such as Detroit or New York, to see if our findings are unique to Baltimore City or if they're more generalizable to what's occurring in the US. So I'd like to thank everyone who helped me with this project and with the summer program overall. It's been a wonderful experience. Give my references. And thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> Christina's going to drop the mic. Don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, are there any questions? Uh, we'll get the CDC side first. Any questions from the CDC side? Good question. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Uh, could you go back to the slide um, with the bar graph on them? At least just one of them. One more. Could you interpret that p-value for me? Is that saying it's statistically saying completely different on that, just that group that you have circled, or is that overall? Yeah, so the p-value refers, it's kind of small, but it refers to the difference between proportions for those who are currently on PrEP. So it's for the 18% compared to the 50%. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions? Yes, uh, thank you. This is really uh, important work to have gotten done in such a short period of time. I really uh, salute that. And a question I've got is the distinction of how you chose the 14 to, I think, age 24 uh, parameter as youth, because I tend to think of youth uh, or as, as a little bit younger. Uh, I'm just curious how, whether that's a standardized uh, range that you chose and, or why you chose it. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you so much for your question. Yes, 13 to 24 is defined as youth by the CDC. And so that's what we use as our um, cutoff range to so here. So it's a, it's, a, it's a defined group for youth determined by the CDC. Uh, thank you. I, actually, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm wondering whether uh, you happen to have noticed any distinction among those who were, let's say, 14 to 18 versus those older and or if there was enough of a sample size to even look at that. Um, yeah, so that was not analyzed in this particular project, but that is an interesting like, question to really think about in the future. Um, I know a like, majority of people are probably towards like, the upper end of their teenage years or early um, 20s, um, but that's something to look into the future, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? On the CDC side. <laughs> on Baltimore side. Have fun. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, one thing I was curious about, so we talked about in Baltimore about you know, geographic disparities, so I don't know if you had a chance to kind of assess that in any way to see if there were, even within like black, you know, or if there are disparities in like county. Um, yeah, so that's a wonderful question. That's something to look into in the future as well. But for this particular project, we looked at the data from the various clinics um, in, the, in Baltimore, but we did not. Um, create cascade for each county, but that would be an interesting future study to conduct. Yes. And, and this data represents just Baltimore City? Baltimore City, yes. Oh, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can, can you repeat it? Because we're recording. And, and this, so Christina was absolutely right. Um, this data represents that just for Baltimore City, which was a focus on the impact program. Mm -hmm. And I was 
add to the questions that again, Christina was absolutely right about the, the youth um, age range. So we often classify uh, adolescents and young adults in that age category. And it's also uh, defined by the epidemiology of Baltimore, where youth have uh, the greatest increases in HIV uh, rates. And so that's why I also work very interested in this population and providing that. Any other questions? You know I have a question. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I have a question. So, so um, we're always talking about in the rats, well, what is, so what? You know, what is the significance of this? What what can we do? So you have this huge drop off. Do you think it's um, that the providers need more education? What can we do to kind of uh, compel, um, to make that a little bit different? So it's not 41% right there. Um. Yes, yeah, so that's something to, that we thought about throughout this whole process, really. Um, again, it's, I'm hesitant to make any firm recommendations because we don't, we have to further delve into why. This is like more like what's happening, but we, it's important to look into why there's such a big drop off. So it could be that maybe providers need additional training or some type of, um, you know, more standard protocol by how, when and how to refer individuals to PrEP. Um, it, could, it could also be that maybe people are don't care to learn more about PrEP. Um, so again, I think um, it is on the provider side for this front, but it's, it's more important to really look into why um, this is happening in the first place and then create um, make a recommendation about what to improve upon in the future. Okay. So then my follow-up question with that <laughs> is, um, so you showed, I believe, um, by race, is that called by race? Why, why do you think that, that there is that difference in terms of those who are currently on PrEP. Were you, did you have any information about insurance status or anything that you can kind of hypothesize mm -hmm. or think about that? Um, that wasn't the main focus for this um, project, essentially, but um, it could, based on past literature, it could be that people, I um, mean, again, the common barriers, it could be the cost of PrEP, especially if you don't have medical insurance, then paying out of pocket this could be really expensive, or it could be that there's competing priorities that can um, com that can conflict with taking a medication every single day, which is challenging for um, most people in general. Um, so again, uh, the next future step would be to look into more why is there such a dis uh, why there's such a gap. But um, it could be that again, it could be cost, it could be stigma in trying to obtain prep or take prep. Um, could also just be, um, again, competing interests and other um, priorities that, mm -hmm. that take precedent over this, like food and transportation, right. housing, things of that nature that could compete with um, their concern of taking PrEP every day, especially since it's a preventative medication, too. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be another reason. So thank you so much for this, because um, you kind of identified that this might be an area where you have a racial um, health disparity, and so that would be an important um, area to kind of pursue. So it's very good work, and we appreciate it. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Uh, for our next presenter, we have uh, Simone Sawyer. So uh, Simone is also a Master of Science student. She's at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And the title of her presentation 